first, thank you for inviting me, whomever did, but um, not here to opine about the core of what you're already doing. Uh, the request was, could I offer comments on one aspect, which I don't think is already on your agenda, but I would argue could or should be, and that is of all the options before you, raising taxes, cutting benefits, uh, getting better returns on the corpus and so forth. There's one leg of the stool missing in my view, and that is in the context of the nature of the problem, which is generational. You don't have to solve it tomorrow. You'd love to, we'd all love to, but you can't wave a wand at this one. So to the extent you are interested, and this is entirely up to you and your colleagues, uh, I happen to think that there are opportunities with state government to save money, significant sums of money, if you add it all up. That's work, it's hard work, uh, but we have identified some of those in the course of our work and I'll share those with you and then you can get back to your regularly scheduled program. So uh, the first one, these are, I think kind of in order, I, I collated them by hand and missed those little rubber things that old, you know, in 50 years ago, people used to do when they collated by hand, remember those guys? I didn't have those, so I hope it worked out. Um, we did a job a few years ago which was just a lark, in effect, on my part. I was curious about uh, the cost of public safety in Vermont, because as you know, not all of it is in the budget in the same place. Corrections is in AHS and so forth. So you, you never really see it holistically. So we did that, and that's the first graph. Look at the number, $574 million in one year. Now, I, I can't honestly say whether that's not enough, just right, or too much. I'm guessing that smart people could identify redundancies and inefficiencies in the system and save a few bucks. You know, 1% of 574 million dollars is by definition 5.7 million dollars for a 1% say. Now, this is a big deal. You know, that this system has evolved over time and there are vested interests everywhere. Some of them are probably right behind me. Uh, so it's not an easy thing to even contemplate, let alone do. It would take time but it might even be for the better, regardless of the fact that you're looking for money under rocks. Uh, anyway, that's a big one. And you know, if you were to make 3%, that's $17 million. It's a lot of money. Uh, second, as you are know, are well aware, certainly uh, GovOps and others, uh, state overtime has grown 39% since FY16. And in 20, it was $25.4 million. Now, there are lots of reasons for this. We know many of them. Some of them are in the short term unavoidable. It would require a great deal of work to make this look very different. Nevertheless, I don't see a group like you having been organized to address that particular question. Maybe it's time. Uh, you know, at 25 million, a 10% savings, again, $2.5 million every single year, because this is just going to keep going up if we don't fix it. The next one is something that really appeals to me. We're working on a, a job right now. The report will probably be out in a few weeks or a month. A number of years ago, with a former employee, now uh, CFO at tax, Andrew Stein, and I talked about um, the fact, we knew this, but we hadn't seen the data, that the same procedure at your hospital might cost $4,000. At your hospital, it might cost seven. Now, Thank goodness, state employees don't have to worry about that. They have a platinum healthcare plan and most everything, and a lot of Vermonters, but not all. On the other hand, over time, as um, deductibles have grown, small businesses are often, you know, the self-employed and many others like the state uh, just pay for this stuff. Now, that's a problem. That's a big problem that you can't serve to solve today or tomorrow, but there's something the state could do. Last year, to HR's annual report, the state's share of the healthcare costs for its employees and their families was $107 million. Here again, you save 1%, it's a million bucks. We have something in mind that has been tried in other parts of the country now for a number of years. A couple of Fortune 500 companies that are self-insured said and have tens of thousands of employees said, if you have a heart problem, you're going to Cleveland and we're going to fly you there and put you up with your wife, your husband, whatever, because they can save so much money. Now, as I said, as I understand, state employees don't really have a need for that. So there's not much of an incentive. So the question is, could we develop an incentive for them and literally pay them to go to your hospital instead of yours? I don't know. We have some data that I hope will be compelling to you guys. Uh, it's an interesting subject. And there are other ways to get about it, uh, not just the incentive uh, approach. The next one is something I've brought to your committee before, uh, which is something we discovered 
um, when we did a couple of audits, there were two parallel at the time about employee misconduct, how the state handles that. We knew nothing about it. Oh, hi, Michael. Um, and it involves, as you know, the investigative process and then it, that those uh, results are forwarded to the appointing authorities and, and so forth. And they make a decision about what, if any, discipline is, is required. What we found is that while the system works pretty well uh, at the margins, it's very slow. And there's a cost to that and a very significant cost on the order of $1.8 million a year for relief from duty. Uh, I have no problem with the system design. It's appropriate. If you as a supervisor think that I shouldn't be in the office while my case is being investigated, fine, no problem. But if it goes on for six months or a year, that's a problem. Uh, if you get the report from the investigators and don't act on it for months, that's a problem. And that's what we found. And that's what one of the, the things shows you the timeline for the investigations themselves, not just the, the total process. So that's an opportunity. Again, that's not big bucks, but if you could save a third of that's $600,000 a year times 20 years is more than a nickel. Um, we did a job a few years back on BGS management of capital projects. We looked particularly at uh, nine whose estimated cost was $92 million going. We found that for a lot of reasons. I'm not pointing fingers. It's not about bad guys, but they were $24 million over budget. Now, I was talking to the former IT guy from JFO, Dan Smith, the other day, real nice guy. And I, I mentioned that to him and he said, that's a win in IT world. <laughs> well, that's a shame. Um, but nevertheless, that's the kind of thing where I have no reason to believe that Chris Cole, who had come over from AOT and said, we have a better system to make progress on this and his successor, I expect they've done just that. I hope so. I see no reason why not because it's in their interest as well. So, but these things, you know, this, that's a lot of money. $24 million, and, and there's uh, a slide in here about project, the projects we looked at and the extent to which they were in terms of dollars and percent. And in some cases, the problem was poor planning. In some cases, the legislature changed its mind six times about what they wanted from them. There's a whole bunch of moving parts. But to the extent you can make that process more streamlined, more effective, less likely to be uh, affected by all those variables, the better. Uh, we did a job, now this one's not, again, not big money. I don't know how much savings there are there, but between BGS and AOT, of course, a different fund, it's not general fund. I have to believe there are ways to save money when you're spending that kind of money. Uh, the next one is fun job we did uh, because I had always been interested in this curious little issue of the state's lease of high elevation lands to the skiers. I mean, that's obviously extremely valuable land. We don't think of it that way, but it really is to them. You can't have a ski area unless you go to the top. It's not going to be a very attractive ski area. So, you know, these leases and their terms, as we pointed out, were developed, adopted at a time when the ski resorts were your grandfather's ski resorts and not the ones that we have today. There, most of them are four season. Um, it was all about lift ticket revenues, only on lifts that were on state land and so forth. And now, obviously, a big part of their business model is well, would those million dollar or $2 million condos at, at Spruce Peak at Stowe be worth that much if it wasn't for their high elevation scheme? No, of course not. So we are getting money from all the sources that you know, generate revenue in tourism, no question about it. Sales and use, food meals, property tax uh, transfer and so forth. Um, and that's a good thing, but the lease payments are, have not kept up. And when we brought this to your attention, <laughs> Uh, the response within a nanosecond from the industry lobbyists was, we'd really rather not discuss that. And there was no discussion. So it, it, the problem is, and I don't know how you overcome this, but the lease have terms that say they cannot be revised or amended without the permission of the skiers. Rather clever of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good one. Uh, and there's some opportunity there, I think. Uh, we did a, another job that Andrew found torturous, but uh, turned out to be, I think, a really good job. On sole source contracts, the question was, to what extent, times several years ago, was the state proving? You know the process, of course. If you write a letter for a job that's over now, I think, 25000 to the uh, Secretary of Administration, they can approve a sole source if you demonstrate to their satisfaction that there's no other way. And, of course, there's lots of reasons why they're appropriate. After Irene, we didn't have time to put RFPs. Uh, if you buy a product or a service, it can only be provided by one entity. Okay, you knew that going in. You got to re-up with them and so forth. 
but we found an excessive amount of sole source contracts. It was $68 million worth uh, from only five entities, the big ones, obviously. And, you know, there are people, unfortunately, some of our neighbors who think that state government is rife with incompetence and corruption. That is certainly not the case. And I hate to be the guy who they look at and say, see, he told us. It's just that it's, well, there's a lot of reasons for all those sole source contracts. And a lot of people, I think, have addressed that. If I'm not mistaken, the fifth floor, this governor took that very seriously. And we haven't gone back to do it again because it took forever. But I, I think they've made some progress in that regard. So that's a good thing. But it's the kind of thing that you should check periodically and see how they're doing. Uh, a couple of other things that are not quite like, you know, inside baseball are more programmatic. We do have some programs, as I pointed out in a uh, report several years ago in the Agency of Commerce that cannot, we cannot quantify the return on investment on these programs. And I would hope that you would agree that if you're funding a program and you can't determine the extent to which you're getting return or how much, then why do we have the program? Maybe we should think about how else to allocate those resources to in some way where we can determine its ROI. And one of those was in the paper the other day, and that's veggie. You know, we have a council that just awarded $6 million to a guy who said, ah, I was coming anyway. And I just did a report last year uh, looking very closely, uh, scrubbing the otherwise confidential information that you can't even see uh, on a group of samples, sample applicants whose materials are. And I, I hate to say it, but um, there, there is virtually no due diligence. They basically say, you told us that without this incentive, you'll go somewhere else. That's good enough. For us. Frankly, that's not good enough for me, a state auditor, but I can't get anybody to listen. The bottom line is there's a guy named Tim Bartik, who is unquestionably the most respected researcher in the country on these general issues, and has been working on it for 25 years. He, he waited forever to do a job but for the but for is the heart of this program, as you know. So he finally did a couple of years ago, which was great timing for me, and because I was working on this other stuff. And his he looked at thirty but for studies done by other people who he respected, sort of an analysis of all they had done. And he said the takeaway is pretty straightforward: at least seventy-five percent of the economic activity supposedly incentivized by these programs would have occurred anyway. Sometimes as much as ninety-eight. So in the face of that, uh, I don't know why we don't have a conversation about how else we can get back. Now here we're talking about using the money for pension, so that's a different thing. In any case, that's one. The other is one that I know is close to everybody's heart, I think, particularly those who come from those counties and districts, but we spend, it's not a fortune, it's only about $3 million a year. And by the way, the veggie money doesn't seem like a lot. It, it averages about three point five million. Although because of the Marvell in 19, which was 5 million, which I did a small report on, and the, beat, the MTX one the other day was six million. So the annual is gonna go up pretty soon. The other program, and we've talked about this before, particularly because tourism and marketing regularly comes to the legislature and says, why don't you give us a percentage of the increase in the rooms and meals tax? It'll help boost our available funds and we can do good things. The implication is that there's a causal relationship between what they do and the rooms and meals tax. And there is no such, there's not even a correlation, let alone a causal connection. And I've talked about this, Tom Cabet has published in some of his fiscal notes about this. You know, there are times when the uh, rooms and meals is going this way and you've cut tourism and marketing. So there really is no connection. And in this report that I mentioned from a couple of years back, we looked at the peer reviewed literature on this and a whole bunch of other economic related subjects. And there isn't much out there on tourism and marketing. Almost all the work we've done is done on behalf of states who hire a small number of firms that almost every state uses. What a surprise, they tell them what they want. And that's what some of the research points out, it's not an opinion. Anyway, the point is, uh, and even more importantly than that is that not surprisingly, many of the players in this field are big players by our standards, anyway, ski areas and so forth. They have to invest in advertising and marketing. That's the nature of their business. They're fools or they won't be in business long if they don't. The economic census tells us that they spend 80 to $100 million a year in Vermont on marketing and advertising. There is no methodology available to tell us what the effect of our 3 million is compared to that 80 to 100. It can't be done. Having said that, that doesn't mean that there's no value in the 3 million, but I don't know what the value is. Should we spend twice as much or nothing? I have no idea. Again, it's a program that, that we or independent objective people can't quantify. And that's about $3 million a year. 
My good friend, Michael Sorotkin, wouldn't be surprised to hear me say that the new worker grant program also suffers from some of these problems <laughs> in terms of uh, estimating its value. It has an, an unwritten but for that uh, we learned in the little work we did about the first, uh, the remote worker grant program. A number of people weren't shy about saying we were coming anyway. My wife had a job, so we were coming, and that kind of stuff. Just too bad. Um, a couple things from the early days of my tenure are not big dollars in and of themselves, but they are indicative of the fact that if you, you know, look underneath stuff periodically, you'll find stuff. One of them was the subject of the first piece of audit art in my tenure. A team was looking at the company that was providing medical services to the prisoners. And they were, I think they were in the Chittenden facility. And they were waiting to meet with someone. And uh, one, of the, one of my senior auditors noticed a box sitting on the floor. And you'll see it there. Uh, I think it's the last page. And in it were all these blister packs of medication. And they were being discarded. They were either uh, from an inmate who had been released or died or whatever the case may be. As it turned out, we looked into it and there was a clause in the contract with these folks that said, if you don't use it, return it and we'll give you credit or cash. And they weren't doing that. They had no inventory control to speak of. So at, at our suggestion, they did that. And 15 months out, they had saved $450,000. <laughs> you know, that doesn't compare to the, the thing about public safety, but state government is a big enterprise. And I don't care how good the people are, it's impossible to catch everything. We're human beings and the systems are complex. We're all busy. So that was a fun one. Another early one was related to cell phones. I was curious about that because I'd been hearing that some departments at that time in 11 and 12 had started buying a lot of cell phones. And I thought, okay, what do I know from cell phones? So I said, let's look at it. So we picked five of the biggest entities and said, how did they do? Well, um, they didn't do so well because, you know, AOT is good at transportation. A&R is good at what they do. They're all good at something, but they're not very good at cell phones. They weren't then. And because of the decentralized nature, of much of state government, they were given the authority to decide how many cell phones to purchase and whom to give them to, and which plans to buy. As it turned out, they bought plans that provided for 11 million minutes. They didn't use 5 million of them. 9% of the phones they distributed were never used, and 20% were used for no more than 100 minutes in an entire year. So. Again, that doesn't make them bad people. They thought they were doing a good thing and the right thing. Oh, cell phones, that's the way we got to go. And they did that. They just didn't do it very well. Um, and we were told that there were hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings if they just got a better plan. And by the way, that's an interesting sidebar. Uh, Deb DeMarty, well, you know Deb, of course. Uh, Deb does the head purchasing person in, in the way. At the time, she learned how some of this stuff works. If it's a, tech, a highly technical and complicated subject that's already been done in 27 other states. And Vermont says, oh my God, why should we reinvent the wheel and come up with an RFP about technical stuff we don't know that much about? They say, quite understandably, oh, those guys already did that. Let's jump on to theirs. And there are provisions that allow you to jump on in some cases. You don't always get quite the same deal and so forth. So that's what is done periodically. And it seems reasonable on its face. On the other hand, those states may not be like Vermont. There could be a lot of reasons why it's not a great model. It's a great model for Deb and her staff because they were already over. But there's stuff like that floating around that and we don't have enough staff for resources. I'm not asking for more. We don't have enough staff to do all this stuff all the time. These are just some examples. And every governor who comes in says, you know, we can save this much. And I know they mean it, but then you hit the ground and you've got 27 fires to put out and big stuff happening. You can't get to all of this. So that's just an example of what we've done in the office, the things we've identified. I happen to think these savings, some of these, if you all committed to it, could be achieved in a reasonable period of time and add to your, or add a bucket, a whole bucket conceivably to the money you're trying to raise. So I'm gonna respond, I <laughs> have a response to this. You know I love your reports. Well, thank you. And I, you also know I take great exception to the um, public safety report. Take exception to quantifying the costs? We just counted the dollars, <laughs> Senator. Believe me, we're gonna have this conversation in gum hops next year. Okay. Big time. But anyway, I appreciate the reports. My concern with this is that we we do have an issue that needs to be solved. And if we need to put more money into it, are you suggesting that we wait until we find savings here? Because we're not necessarily talking about new funds to go in. No, I know that. I mean, we, we might be, but we're not necessarily. That's one of the options. 
So uh, if we if we just wait, if, if we say we need to put uh, thirty million dollars in, if we wait until we find thirty million dollars here before we solve the pension issue, it's going to keep getting worse and worse. So are you suggesting that we not do anything now? And and actually, these aren't within our purview at all. These. Well, you it is in the purview of the legislature. But we're not the legislature. No, I, I understand that. But to be clear, I did not say don't do anything. Did anyone hear me say that? I no. Said it was I said need to be solved right now. No, no. But that doesn't mean you can't identify parts of a solution now if you so choose. Those are the recommendations you all will agree to make to the legislature. This is what I think is another potential leg of the school. This That's is all. Potential for money. Yes. Okay. I. Yeah. I, I guess I, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. How much money does the state of Vermont spend in the ed fund every year? Uh, pardon me? How much do we spend on public education every year in the state of Vermont? I think the ed fund is 1.8 or thereabouts. So we can make the same generic say that we just save 1%. No, you can't that. use that money for this purpose. You could use it for teachers, but not for state employees. That's why I talk about that. But we're still talking like the simplicity, I think, where the Senator Warnham's going is. We hear all the time, we hear, oh, well, if you just save 1% of the 574 million, it, it sounds easy to find that $5.7 million. But when you start digging into each program, you realize their employees are overworked, they're understaffed, all these other issues. The same conversation. I mean, you're like looking at the teachers here. If we said go 1% of your school budget. No, I'm talking about reorganizing the entire system. Right. But we could That's a the much... same thing on education as well. So I think it's just a, I think it's an over of finding those costs, from my perspective. Okay, are you talking about oversimplifying state government or oversimplifying our pension system? I'm are not talking about oversimplifying anything. Well, okay. <laughs> I don't know where this is coming from. <laughs> no, he did, not, not me. <laughs> he makes it oversimplifying. I mean, I'm saying if fine. you and your colleagues believe that $574 million for public safety in the state of Vermont is a good number, then forget about it. I mean, I'm saying if you don't, then it's worthy of a conversation because it's a huge amount of money I'm in a state gonna, with 630,000. I'm going to interrupt you and step back once. There are 13 of us on here. Only five are legislators. This is not a legislative committee. I know that. This is a committee that's supposed to look at solving the issues of our retirement system and our pension. And and I, I just am... I don't... To be honest, I don't want this committee looking at this public safety, how to save money on the public I safety. didn't ask this committee to do that. I didn't ask you to okay, do that. I'm just what you're... This committee is going to make recommendations yes. about how to address the problem that's been put in your lap, right? That involves finding a bunch of money, a whole lot of money. This is one place to look for money in making state government more efficient. Okay, so that's all I'm saying. Okay, and I and I would hope that they're all interested in that. My, my I see nodding heads. If we if we suggest that uh, we can make a list of where to save money, we but that's not going to be our prime concern. Um, Why not? I mean, if you need a hundred dollars and you can identify sources of twenty over here and thirty over here and forty over here, and you come up short, you could say, you know, we can take a little time on that piece, and here's some places to look. That's my point. That's all I'm saying. Thanks, um, um, I just have a, a little analogy that's going on in my head sitting here as a teacher because I've been teaching since 1992. And right around 2000 ish, we had the No Child Left Behind Act passed. And what that did for education, pros and cons, is it, it asked us to look always oh, more heavily. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I that's I, okay. I'm used to it. I know how to stop and wait for the attention. Okay. I need to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just. I, I've got. I'm not trying to ask here. Are, so. are you going to say what you like to share with the whole class? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no sidebars. No sidebars. This stoner has arrived. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can get myself back to what I was thinking. Um, in in about 2000, how much behind came? One of the things that it did on, I think, the positive end for our industry is it asked us to look at ourselves. And we had to start looking at the things we were doing that didn't necessarily go for the outcomes we thought they, you know, they would deliver. 
And so we had to start looking at research-based curriculum and we had to start analyzing our industry through the lens of, are we getting where we want to go? Uh, is what we're doing effective? And that's what I hear you asking. And I think it's a valid exercise. I hear what you're saying too, Jeanette, that, that like, okay, but the purview of this group is that we need to do what we are here to do. And I get that, but I think I really love this perspective because um, I think it's a really valid exercise. They are we getting for our money what we want to be getting for our money? And I would hope that our legislature can devote resources to do that. Um, I don't have the solution of how because I don't know how you all do all the inner workings and people in the work past, like you said. I, I don't mean to ask you to finish time. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I just appreciate the perspective thinking about how I feel in my 30 year career, I've become so much better because I did that reflection and I was fighting it at the beginning, man. I wanted to do all my all my centers exactly how I'd always done them, but I'm a way better teacher now for that, you know, analysis and looking at where am I what? What can I do differently? Ooh, I gotta let that unit go. It's just not getting me where I want to go. Here's a, an I apologize interesting guys to you. I, I just I I'm so aware that we have so such limited time here that if we start looking at any of these things, we could go down the rabbit hole so quickly that we would get to where we need to get by the end. And we can make suggestions for that this is some place that the legislature could look for savings. But well, I don't think that we are the ones that we can make those suggestions, but it's up to the appropriations committees and the finance committees and the institutions. And whatever those committees are to deal with um, those issues to come up with to take make the changes in the policies and the procedures. I'm aware of the exactly. process. Yes. My point was to say savings is an opportunity for all of you mm -hmm. to mention to your colleagues, because that's where the report's going to go, and not just limit yourself to cutting the benefits or whatever you're talking about. This should be an entirely separate bucket, in my view. And it solves problems you do it. $25 million last year in overtime. You know. Uh, uh, I'm Andrew, I'm Rich, kindergarten teacher in Waterbury. I really appreciate you coming in today. Um, you know, hearing about MTX coming to Waterbury is really exciting to me, thinking, oh, we have the opportunity in five years to potentially have 250 new people. That means families. That means, uh, you know, employment for new teachers. Uh, hearing the tech CEO say that $6 million was really a but I'm our entire district got less than six million in uh, relief funds. Um, and just think, here you go, tech company, here's six million dollars. Uh, I think it's worth investigating these things. And I think your point that uh, not having to solve every single thing right now is a really important one. Um, this is something the pension system is not going to collapse in one night. So why not take the time to investigate some of these savings? and? Um, Doing hard work is important. Looking into those things is important. Thank you. My feelings exactly. Thank you. Um, Jeanette, I hear, I, I hear what you're saying. I think in that getting too far into the weeds of some of this stuff might be out beyond our, um, our purview. Um, but at, you know, at the same time, we talked about okay, maybe maybe this amount of new funds uh, needs to come in and make suggestions as to where that. Where that might come from. I, I'm particularly interested in the in the lease payment uh, question because I think there's precedent. Um, Colorado, I believe, posts their lease payments in uh, towards their own funded licenses. So I was just wondering your look at this um, uh, issue. Did it take into account what other states were doing? Um, at all? Sorry, we looked at what the feds do because. Feds lease a lot of land all over the country and here. There are almost as many uh, ski areas that lease federal land as the state land, and their leases are much more generous and able to be modified over time. Ours are not. That is the key for us. And that lobbyist for the Ski Area Association knew exactly what he was doing because the leases were written to their advantage. And even if he hadn't said what he did, uh, the legislators themselves would have been in an awkward place if they said, Well, we'd like to look at it. Well, how do you do that? 
it takes a commitment from a governor and a legislature and some very creative lawyering. Uh, we didn't see a pathway through that. That wasn't our task. We we're just looking at how, how are we at this place in time where the ski areas in particular, many of them, not all, many of them back then were succeeding and growing wildly. And uh, as I said, for uh, seasons and real estate everywhere, but the lease payments adjusted for inflation were going down. We, under, we now understand the structure of the lease arrangements and basically said, you guys could look at this, but it's going to be challenging. It's not a lot of money there either. It's just one of those many little things. I mean, we're only, a, we're a small staff. I had twice as many people, I'd have twice as many suggestions, but I don't. <laughs> and there were others I didn't bring up today because they're, it's not only that they're modest, but they're very, very challenging. We did a job on the judiciary and they are required in concert with the tax department in the end to get, you know, low income uh, folks who are arrested to get them attorney and a judge and a clerk decide in the first instance whether they qualify. There's something they fill out and that's that. And everybody is assumed to have to be able to pay 50 bucks. And then it depends on what, what you're charged for. If it goes up to a felony, then they can charge you more and blah, blah, blah. Well, the judiciary wasn't doing anything, much of anything to collect those funds because they wouldn't go to them. It went to the defender general. And the tax department had a small role to play, but they weren't doing anything either. And you know, it's hard to get money from really low income people who've just been accused of a crime, <laughs> I admit. But the system could be improved. And then we, we found in reviewing some public assistance programs that there were parents who were cheating the system. And BF, my good friend, Ken Schatz, who's now retired, said, Doug, you know, what you're asking is for us to do something, which is, my thought was, why don't you make the parents be accountable? That would just hurt the kids. You can't deny that. So some of these things, that's why I didn't include them because there's no simple way around them. But OT, these are things that the state should look at anyway. And I know, Michael, we talked about this recently. There was an effort made years ago. So anyway, to be clear, I wasn't suggesting your committee dig into these issues. That's what we did. All I'm doing is saying there are, there are reasons to believe that state government can be made more efficient in a number of different ways. And that's not your charge. That's your charge right? as elected officials. That's not something that can be done in the short term. I know that. There's a lot of reasons why things don't get done quickly. Here you are looking for money. This is an opportunity. That's all I'm saying. And I appreciate that. And I am going to again apologize for giving the titles. Um, this one was the first one. And I have particular um, emotional reaction to this one. So, um, well, to be clear, I don't. <laughs> and I apologize for that. That's all right. So, um, Thank you. That's all I got. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's always fun to explore some of these um, some of these projects that you and your staff have done, and I appreciate the, the care and attention that you put into giving a, giving your clear assessment of um, you know where there may be inefficiencies in state government. It's a and big. Some of the choices and changes that you have made. Well, I, I should be clear when we complete reports and make recommendations, as we point out to you every year, uh, most of our recommendations are adopted. On the big issues, that's a lot harder. This requires you dealing with competing interests and so forth, and it's, that's a simple thing, I get it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I happen to believe that any $6 billion entity can find some savings. Yes. I don't care whether it's public, private, or in between. Yeah, so, clearly. All right, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. So task force, we have a few moments. Um, do we wanna take, uh, take our break early and uh, we don't have an afternoon break scheduled here. So um, let's take an eight minute break and let's all try to be back here. Prompt.